Hello, my name is Beatsy Wu and I work at the Annie E. Casey Foundation. On behalf of the foundation and our partners at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Social Work and the National Implementation Research Network, welcome. We are so glad you're able to join us for this webinar on advancing equity through implementation. In the next two hours, you will hear from community leaders, implementation practitioners, and researchers on how equity can be integrated into implementation practices and tools. Too often, people think of equity being incorporated only into practices, programs, and policies, and not about how those interventions are implemented. Both are important to achieving equitable results that respond to community values, assets, and needs. By bringing a community's history, perspective, and voice into the selection of an intervention and its implementation, you can increase the likelihood that it will live on beyond the initial burst of energy and funding. Drawing on the knowledge and expertise of community members to define an issue and identify usable solutions is central to implementing with equity. You'll see great examples of this work in action throughout Bringing Equity to Implementation, the supplement to the summer issue of the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Our sessions today will feature conversations with authors of these articles who practice equitable implementation and who will generously share what they've learned. So now I'll turn things over to Sarah Verbeest of the UNC School of Social Work. Thank you. It's so exciting to be here with everyone today. I am here to welcome you and also go over a few housekeeping tips. Um, so um, we are currently in Zoom webinar. So this means that you can only see and hear our panelists, not all attendees. Um, it also means you're not on camera, so you can relax and really enjoy being in this space. But we really do want to hear from you. So please use the chat box to engage with each other and ask questions of the panelists. We will be keeping our eye on the chat box. Um, please do not use the Q&A. We want to just focus on chat if we could today. Are you not sure where you're supposed to be? after this session, um, please use the website to find your way. The website is implementequity.caseyevents.org. And once you're there, it's really well organized and you should be able to find your way. If you need technical assistance, please email casey at rive.co. So that's casey at rive.co. And finally, um, we would love to see some energy happening in social media. Um, so if you are sharing quotable quotes, which we think there will be many from our time together, um, or something interesting that you've learned, um, if you wouldn't mind to use hashtag UNC Imp Practice 2021, that would be fantastic. So now to kind of warm up our brains a little bit, we have a poll for all of you. So we could launch the poll. This is a poll that is themed to the weather in North America. Um, and we've been thinking a lot about pumpkins. So we want to know, how do you feel about pumpkin? So these are your options. Yes to all things pumpkin, pie, soup, lattes, you name it. Um, sweets only, pumpkin pie and muffins are my love language. Savory only. Bring on the pumpkin soup and curry, and then nope, keep pumpkin away from me. So let's open the poll and see where we fall. So can we launch the poll? So please vote. How do you feel about pumpkins? All right. Wow, we have a lot of folks joining us today. How exciting. Um, and also exciting that you all are participating in our, in our welcome poll. I'm seeing over th almost 350 people together. That's amazing. All right, I'm feeling that we have a winner. And I'm feeling like, I feel like we can close the poll. Um, and so the winner is uh, yes to all things pumpkin. Almost half of you are all into pumpkin this season. Um, there's a few folks that um, 
are not fans of pumpkin. Um, so thank you so much for um, joining with us. Um, it's not the same to be building community virtually, but um, I think we can do it um, with chat and with social media. And I think that breakout sessions are gonna be wonderful. So with that, I am going to turn turn the mic over to my friend and colleague, Allison Metz, who is also with the UNC School of Social Work. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. We are so, so happy to be here this morning. Um, I really enjoyed that poll. I'm a huge fan of pumpkins, so uh, I thought that was a lot of fun. Uh, so, so thanks so much. Um, we are, I'm going to run through the agenda for today. Uh, Sarah did a little bit of anticipatory guidance around that with the housekeeping. Uh, but just to let folks know, we will be in this opening plenary together until right before noon, probably finish up a few minutes before noon so that folks can move to their breakout rooms. Um, and those breakout discussions will focus on uh, the articles that were in the Stanford Social Innovation Review Supplement. So we're, we're thrilled to have um, authors from, from all eight articles with us today. Um, and so we'll move into those breakouts and then they'll take about 30 minutes in the breakouts where you'll hear from the authors. And then we'll come back to a closing plenary that will last uh, the, the final 30 minutes. As said, you can navigate to all of the sessions through the agenda page, which again is implementequity.caseyevents.org. We are going to keep dropping that link in the chat. If you are you know, on your computer and have the event page open, you can just keep going back to it. But if for some reason you lose that event page um, on your browser, you can just um, look into the chat or reopen it at implementequity.caseyevents.org. And our hashtag is down there again. Um, so we really do hope to get some, some good Twitter action going today move to the next slide. So um, again, we are here really to celebrate uh, this incredible um, supplement that we had the honor of, of being a part of. The, the authors in this supplement, Bringing Equity to Implementation, did an incredible job of, of really bringing us case studies uh, from the field. Um, all of the, the articles were, were co-authored by implementation researchers and practitioners, as well as communities. So we're really, really excited again to have all those authors here with us today. Before we move into the breakouts, I'll talk a little bit more about the six factors to essential um, that are essential for equitable implementation. Um, but you know, just to give a little teaser about that, we're going to be talking about important topics like building trusting relationships and addressing power differentials. So we're really um, excited about those breakout groups. And you know, as we move into closing plenary, we'll um, also be talking about the 10 recommendations that emerged from those case studies on how we put equitable implementation into action. And I think I, without further ado, I'm going to move us to our opening uh, plenary speakers this morning. We are so honored to have um, these amazing women here with us this morning. So we have Dr. Rachel Shelton, who is an associate professor of sociomedical sciences at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health, where she's the co-director of the Community Engagement Core Resource at the Irving Institute for Clinical and Translational Research and leads a university-wide initiative on implementation science. We have Prajaka Adsul, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of New Mexico and a member of the university's Comprehensive Cancer Center. And finally, we have Dr. April O, oh, who's a senior advisor for implementation science and health equity in the team of the Office of the Director and the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the National Cancer Institute. We are so thrilled to have you here and don't want to hold things up any further. So we will um, move right into our opening plenary. Welcome. Thank you so much. And I will share my screen. I'm running the slides today for everyone. Uh, look good? Not yet? Look good? Yes. Can we see it full screen now? Okay, 
perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much for that help. Um, no Zoom call is complete or keynote is complete without some Zoom trouble, right, in today's age. So thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and for the honor to speak to all of you today. Uh, on behalf of Rachel, April, and I, we've been very excited about this, uh, this talk and want to talk to you a little bit about our um, just recently published paper, but here we go. So um, the past few decades of surveillance data have really uh, shown and pointed out stark differences in health outcomes for sub subgroups of populations. And critical scholars have said that, you know, these are underlying social and economic disadvantage, disadvantages that lead to health disparities. Um, the key aspect over here is that health disparities adversely affect groups of people who have systematically uh, experienced greater social and economic obstacles to health. And when we think of population subgroups, they could be delineated in terms of race or ethnicity, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, immigration, age, disability, and geographic location. And a key term that has gained recent attention, but coined 30 years ago by the scholar, legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, um, intersectionality reflects on the combined discriminatory effects that Black women experience. And since then has been applied uh, when considering the combined effects of several of these factors. And I cannot move my slides. Oh, perfect. Um, and over the last year, we've experienced a national reckoning of structural racism in terms of COVID-19 health disparities reflecting our skewed investments in underlying forces that shape health, like education, early childhood care, and most importantly, public health practice. Many have declared that racism is a public health crisis, and there is a need to change now by beginning to acknowledge our own practices and policies and commit towards health equity. In this case, health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This term provides a different perspective from health disparities, bringing to the forefront a commitment to address the other underlying causes leading to these disparities, removing obstacles, and overall adopting a solutions-oriented paradigm. Um, there are many versions of this figure that folks have seen, but I'd like to just take one quick minute to reflect on the square title justice. We often focus on providing the tools reflected in the ladders, but don't consider the support structures to straighten the bent tree, reflective of the structural injustices in this community. And when considering health equity, the focus must be on social determinants of health, um, such as education, healthcare, neighborhood env environment, social and community context, and economic stability. As we reflect on these factors, however, we must acknowledge how racism and particularly structural uh, racism in particular, how that contributes towards the pathways that lead to um, health disparities. Um, the commonly and widely used definitions and operationalizations of structural racism include the one by Powell, where he focuses on the macro level systems, social forces, institutions, ideologies, and processes that interact with each other to generate and reinforce inequities. Uh, Bailey and all uh, and colleagues pr propose that it is the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through this mutually reinforcing systems. And recently, um, um, Reskin um, has also described using a systems perspective that race discrimination can um, work together in mutually reinforcement reinforcing components as a systems level, from a systems level perspective as well. A clear example in how structural racism operates in healthcare was provided by Obermeyer and colleagues in 2019, when they showed how a widely used algorithm in the healthcare industry, um, actually trying to predict who would benefit the most exhibited racial bias. And that was because there is a difference between needing care and there is a difference between actually receiving care. And race can have a very critical role to play within these two um, um, components. However, because the algorithm was using healthcare costs as a proxy, 
it was systematically predicting black folks to benefit less from enhanced in interventions. And that was like one of the most clearer, clearest ways in which we were able to see um, how structural racism impacts healthcare. To re-emphasize, um, racism uh, and structural racism go beyond just the individual and the interpersonal. Um, they inf they uh, impact institutions and segregation through, uh, through examples such as segregation. And they are multi-level and multi-sectoral, being impacted by several of these um, intersecting uh, sectors, right? Housing, criminal justice, public health, education, and banking. Um, we, we have now um, actually moved towards not just defining and operationalizing structural racism, but also there's a lot of movement in the field towards measuring structural racism. Um, there isn't a gold standard for how we do this because this is so uh, complex and multi-sectoral, multi-level. However, we do understand that it operates through economic injustices. It operates through lack of economic opportunities. We are understanding from multi-sectoral work, the impact of residential segregation. From the criminal justice system, the impact of, impact of um, the justice system on racial disparities in black and white incarceration rates and the impact of racist policies such as redlining and racial profiling by immigration officials. So there's a growing interest in how to measure structural racism. Uh, we believe as implementation scientists that there is a very important role for implementation science to incorporate such a focus on understanding and addressing structural racism as one of the fundamental drivers of social and health inequities. Um, Implementation science is about moving the needle and ensuring that the research to practice gap is, is closed, uh, ensuring that the evidence-based practices, programs, policies have an impact on population health. It is um, the scientific study of methods, strategies, and uh, influenced by frameworks, how to adopt and uh, integrate evidence-based interventions in real world clinical and public health settings. We are very pleased pleased to know the growing um, recognition of this agenda among many of our colleagues. Um, and we are honored to share with you some of our learnings. And with that, I'll pass the baton to Rachel. Thanks so much, Dr. Edsula, for setting us up so beautifully. Um, I'm so honored to be here. And I'm next gonna move us into really thinking about what would it mean to really prioritize a focus on health equity and addressing structural racism and implementation science. If you can advance the slide. Can you hit the next slide? Thanks, great. So I think many of us, myself included, many of my colleagues were really brought to the field of implementation science because we saw and we see the, the tremendous potential that it can hold in terms of addressing some of these deeply rooted uh, structural and social inequities um, that exist. But when you look at a lot of the commonly applied interventions, strategies, frameworks, theories, and methods and approaches that we've commonly taken in the field in the past 15 years, um, you know, we have not seen health equity be explicit in them. We have not been naming structural racism as a field and trying to actively address it. And while we have seen some movement here, some exciting movement and momentum in the last uh, few years, I think this is a really important time for us to reflect as a field and think really critically about what we have done in the past and how we want to move forward um, towards the future and applying implementation science to promote equity, being explicit about that, making this foundation and I think that really requires that we make explicit attention to how structural racism shapes implementation across all of these areas. You can go next. So why, do, why should we be focusing on racism in the context of implementation? Why does it matter? So we know that racism is part of our social fabric, historically and present. It's a fundamental aspect of our social context. It shapes all of our organizations, our institutions, us as researchers. Um, and it's an ecological exposure, right? It, everyone is exposed to it and it advantages some and disadvantages others. 
We also know, as Dr. Edsul laid out, that structural racism operates within and across systems, inter interconnected systems. So it is reinforced and is it adaptive in terms of how these systems maintain inequities. So they shape our inequities, but they also shape our research to practice gap. So if we think about residential uh, segregation as one example, if we think about the accumulation of differential opportunities, power and resources that has happened because of that intergenerationally, that has huge implications in terms of which populations actually have access to evidence-based interventions, which settings are able to uh, broadly and widely adopt evidence-based interventions. So we know that this has implications for implementation. And if we want to not only document structural racism, but actually actively address it, it really requires that we're really thinking through and being reflective on where both visible and invisible policies and practices and processes are existing in the settings and settings and systems um, in which we are implementing. And I love the example that Dr. Etzul gave about the Obermeyer example. You know, we often think about the interpersonal uh, racism. That's where a lot of the research is focused, but we have to be thinking about those invisible mechanisms and policies policies that are exerting um, racism through our systems. If we are not considering the role and impact of racism in implementation, it can really lead to inaccurate and incomplete understandings and explanations of why health inequities exist. And that has huge implications in terms of the solutions, the strategies, the programs, the interventions that we select to pursue health equity. And that's so important because it also has implications for the investments that we make with resources. So I think these are all critical reasons why this applies to our work and implementation. Okay, next. So as uh, Dr. Atsul laid out, um, we've really made a call to the field in terms of making this explicit, in terms of naming and identifying structural racism as an underlying structural force that impacts implementation. And we make three key recommendations, which I'm gonna go into, about how we need to be thinking about this in our frameworks that guide our work, in our collaborations and our approaches, and in the interventions and strategies that we are applying. And this is critical for not only health equity, but equitable implementation. Okay, next. So what would it mean for us to select and develop evidence-based interventions and strategies with a health equity and anti-racism focus? If you can go next. And I say anti-racism because as we were working on this paper on structural racism, we realized that we have to be much more action-oriented in terms of how we're not only identifying racism, but seeking to address it. So next. So these are just some reflection questions for us to think about as we're selecting what it is we're actually delivering, what the intervention is, the practice, the program, the policy. This is critical to implementation. This lays the foundation of everything that we're focusing on. So we have to ask, does the intervention address structural racism or social determinants of health directly or indirectly? Were communities involved in the evidence generation? Does it reflect their lived experiences? Are we addressing upstream multi-level factors at the community policy systems levels? Are we including sectors that are not only focused on healthcare, but are more broadly in terms of justice settings, community settings? Has the intervention actually been tested among the populations experiencing inequities? Can it be adapted culturally or contextually? And is there evidence that the intervention um, is actually effective at reducing inequities or promoting health equity? So these are all considerations for us in our selection of, of interventions. I think it's really important for us to recognize that many of our evidence-based programs and practices and interventions were not actually developed and tested with or among the populations that are experiencing inequities, right? Structural racism or promoting health equity are not have not necessarily been um, part of the explicit goals of many of these interventions. And most of the interventions are not recognizing how structural racism shapes differential opportunities to be healthy. So often it's not a surprise if we're not centering equity along the way, if we're not trying to address structural racism early, it's often not a surprise that we're not able to successfully implement and sustain uh, evidence-based practices in communities experiencing 
and equity. So I think we really have to step back and reflect a little bit on what we're considering on evidence, considering as evidence, and for whom um, an intervention is evidence-based. Um, I think we also really have to think about prioritizing and expanding the lens with which we're considering evidence to really prioritize interventions, programs, and practices that we know have an impact on structural racism or other um, manifests that relate to structural racism and, and social determinants of health. And there is a growing literature. I've highlighted some of the work by Zenza Bailey and colleagues, David Williams. There's been some amazing work that has started to highlight some promises, pr promising practices and interventions for addressing structural racism. But we need to continue building that evidence base and we need to be partnering with intervention developers so we can be thinking about implementation of them from the start. We also have to expand our evidence base to not only include um, our scientific evidence, our narrowly defined evidence um, you know, that's been through randomized control trials, but what is already being delivered in the community that might be a promising practice? What is community-defined evidence? What are the settings in which communities are already being reached? So again, thinking about the churches, the work sites, the schools, the justice settings, where, uh, where there are trusted leadership and thinking about the investment of um, delivering interventions in these settings. Um, and I think we also have to think about, if you want to go to the next slide, we also have to think about the extent to which we are able to adapt our existing evidence-based interventions with a focus on addressing structural racism and social determinants of health. One example is with my community partners, um, a group of, of national community uh, health workers, their program has been really focused on addressing screening, cancer screening and promoting screening. But in the context of COVID, in the context of all the pressing social determinants that have arisen, they have really expanded the program to address more pressing issues around food insecurity, around housing, around transportation around addressing vaccine concerns, and even around registering people for voting. We know that um, disenfranchisement of populations is a mechanism through which structural racism operates. So we have to think more broadly about how we can complement and synergize our health-focused public health programs with addressing structural racism and social determinants of health and what adaptations might be plausible. If you go next. Great. And I do want to say, even if we're not selecting an intervention that is addressing structural racism, an anti-racism lens would really have us reflect on um, how structural racism might be shaping delivery of the intervention or might be differentially advantaging um, some populations over others. So again, sometimes feel, people feel like they're not able to address some of those societal levels, but, but this kind of lens really encourages us to think about the impacts that structural racism is having on our interventions. What about our implementation strategies? So these are all the, you know, these are all the tools and strategies that we use to actively deliver our interventions, the training, the technical assistance. And there's been great work by um, Powell and colleagues to really identify a taxonomy of strategies. But what's been really missing in the field is consideration of um, the extent to which some of these strategies might reduce or exacerbate inequities. Um, and we really haven't considered whether or not there are ones that might actually directly address structural racism or other determinants of health. So we have to think about, are there strategies that we can deliver that increase trust, community partnerships, ownership, and capacity? Are there opportunities for us to think about organizational, institutional, and policy changes that will address some of the inequities within the system? And in some cases, when you think about the work of Penelope Hall and others, this might require de-implementation or disruption of systems that are delivering racist practices and policies. Um, it, it, like the example of the Obermeyer example that was inadvertently um, disadvantaging black patients. We also have to think about anti-racism training. We know that training is not sufficient to address structural racism, but it is a critical component. It is a foundation um, so that people can start to identify how structural racism is impacting their institutions and um, their provision of care and implementation. So these are some examples of implementation strategies with an equity lens. Next. <laughs> 
Here's a wonderful example that I hope will operationalize this um, a little bit for you. This is from Seikert and colleagues at UNC. And this was an amazing, uh, this was the ACURE trial, the Accountability for Cancer Care Through Undoing Racism and Equity, which was implemented across cancer centers and hospitals in North Carolina. And the goal here, informed by a community and academic partnership, was a multi-tiered implementation approach to address inequities in cancer care delivery across black and white patients. And what they did is they did some uh, anti-racism and health equity training for administrators, staff, and providers. And then they used a real-time electronic health record registry to signal when there were inequities in terms of unmet care, who was recommended treatment or not, and who attended um, appointments. And they used race-specific tracking and live clinical feedback on cancer treatments. And it used nurse navigation to help address some of those barriers and social determinants. We have historically often taken a race-neutral approach in a lot of our implementation strategies and a lot of our policies and practices, um, particularly in healthcare systems. And this can be really problematic if patients are not entering the system at the same point. Some are disadvantaged um, other, over others. So this is a really nice pragmatic example of quality improvement, which addresses structural racism at multiple levels within the system. Okay, next. And I'll say, um, just with that last example, that that approach was effective in eliminating the racial inequities in terms of the delivery of cancer treatment. There's some really other nice other examples in terms of what it would mean to bring an equity lens to our implementation strategies. There's been some amazing work by Annette Brown and colleagues um, in Canada, really focused on delivery of equitable strategies through primary care delivery. And they've done some really great ethnographic work to develop these, particularly focused on working with indigenous populations. Um, and just to give a couple examples, one is they've used an approach of training in cultural safety and cultural humility, which different than cultural competency really has a, a recognition of power differentials and historical violence and, and historical discrimination that has that shapes present day health inequities. So this is an example of training and organizational and systems care delivery in a primary care setting with the goal of equitable care. Um, there's a lot of other great work that is starting to come out. Um, Heather Kame and Derek Griffiths have done a lot of work on anti-racist praxis and training for health professionals and practitioners. And there's a recent uh, review on what would what is needed to actually implement anti-racism interventions in healthcare settings. And it suggests that we have to have leadership buy-in and we have to have resources and support to implement um, these initiatives. And there has to be transparency and accountability, right? We can't just do it and hope that it goes well. We have to be tracking the impact that it has um, in terms of its implementation. So here are a couple examples that I hope will be good resources for you. Okay, next. <laughs> Now let's think about our theories, models, and frameworks and implementation. Um, if you go next, with an equity lens. Okay, so we know that context and multi-level context really matters for creating population health and particularly for um, creating and reinforcing health inequities. So we have our social ecological model here with all the various levels. And in implementation science, we have often focused on really thinking about multi-level context, but we have tended to focus on organizational context when you look at a lot of the empirical literature. So things like leadership and resources and financial incentives. What we've really been missing in implementation science is really a deep understanding of the broader social context, the broader community context, and the broader societal context. Um, and if we think about this, it's so critical because we know that it is that social context and, and we know it is factors like structural racism and discrimination and stigma that operate at all these levels through regulations and practices and policies. Um, across context. So not including this has huge implications for our understanding of the factors that shape implementation. If you go next. <laughs> So I think we have to ask ourselves, as we're doing our contextual assessment in terms of what all the multi-level factors are and contextual factors that might matter as we're planning for and considering implementation, we have to ask ourselves, are we considering and assessing and measuring equity-related contextual factors or determinants, like structural racism, like stigma, like discrimination, like mistrust? 
We have to think about and go even a step further. Are we considering in the settings where we're implementing the mechanisms and processes through which structural racism is embedded? and really peeling away those layers to understand how the structures are creating and reinforcing it, um, health advantages for some and disadvantages for others. And I'll say um, an anti-racist approach would consider and assess the role of structural racism in shaping implementation in health, even if we're not intervening upon it. We would still want to understand the implications it's going to have um, historically and on an ongoing basis. And we may be able to even prioritize our study settings and our, our populations based on our understanding of how structural racism is operating. If you go next. There's been some really great work in this area in terms of adapting existing implementation frameworks with an equity lens. And there have been several, the health equity implementation framework, for example, that has really thought about how racism exerts itself through the clinical encounter and context. Um, there's also been great work in um, really getting at these notions, and I love Lisa Bolig's work here on intersectionality um, and bringing an intersectionality lens to the theoretical domains framework and thinking about how gender, economic factors, sexual orientation, and race really intersect through these social structures um, to create disadvantages. Uh, if you go next. One of my favorite pieces came out this year, and I have learned so much um, from this piece by Alan and colleagues, which takes the Consolidated Framework for Implementation, which is a, a well-known, widely used implementation and planning framework, and really brings a race and racism conscious lens to it, right? So again, we've often taken a race neutral approach, but if we want to be understanding and addressing how structural racism is operating, we have to bring this lens to it. So they applied really the public health critical race praxis and thought about what would this mean for CIFR? And it really illuminates very different findings, right, with this lens. So it highlights how leaders' willingness to examine black and indigenous student and parent experiences of school discrimination and marginalization impacted multiple factors related to implementation. The race and ethnicity of the principles really impacted intervention um, engagement and uptake. And we know that champions is a common approach in implementation, but they found that this was highly racialized. So I think this is a wonderful example that thinks about how to bring a race and racism conscious approach to some of our implementation frameworks. Okay, next. And I'll just highlight, there is such an amazing history of work here by Chandra Ford, Derek Griffiths, uh, many, many people have been working on this for um, many years. And so I'll just highlight that the, the public health critical race praxis um, really is helpful for really operationalizing how race and racism and race as a social construct might be operating in our research and in our research context and in our practice context. So I will put that there as a tool. And there's been some great work by Ryan Dorme and colleagues at the New York Department of Health on how they applied critical race theory to inform some of their trainings on addressing structural racism at the New York City Department of Health. So it's a great example there and hopefully a resource for you. Okay. I also want to say we have to be accountable and transparent. If we're making all these efforts in addressing equity and structural racism through our implementation efforts, we have to be transparent and accountable in terms of whether or not we're making a difference. And again, we have not always been specific in tracking the impact on equity. And I think that matters not only for tracking um, you know, effectiveness, does a program work in terms of health, but also who is reached and who is not, um, which settings are reached um, and are not which programs are implemented equitably or sustained or not. So we have to bring transparency to our tracking um, as well. Okay, next. Finally, I'll just end with this last bucket in terms of thinking about methods and stakeholder engagement um, in terms of an equity lens and anti-racism focus. So I really see community engagement and health equity as going hand in hand. And I think the supplement has done a beautiful job in highlighting this. Um, I don't think community engagement in itself is sufficient to address structural racism, but the co-creation, involvement and empowerment of community voices and them as equitable decision makers at the table is critical. And this kind of approach really creates the structures and processes for incorporating community priorities and perspectives 
not only up front, but throughout uh, the implementation um, and sustainment processes. And I think if this has to be done with care and thinking about um, the investment in community, the investment in terms of sharing of power um, and resources. And so I have put a couple of resources here that talk about this, but I see this as very foundational to this work. Okay, next. So some considerations for us in our own work with community partners. Who are we engaging with how often and who is and is not at the table when decisions about implementation are made? How do our partners benefit from the knowledge and solutions generated from our research? How are power resources and data distributed uh, within our efforts? And how are we reflecting not only in our research efforts, but on our teams and our institutions about how power, racism, and privilege are affecting our partnerships, including historically what has happened through our organizations um, where we are based. So this is critical, this reflection piece. And I've put um, a nice tool there at the bottom on Engage for Equity, which highlights some nice resources in this area. Okay. Uh, there are some amazing examples. I just want to highlight the work of uh, Loretta Jones and Ken Wells, who have taken a community engagement approach to not only defining what interventions um, are implemented in terms of addressing mental health inequities, but also involving the community partners and the design and implementation. It's a, it's a beautiful example, and there's some really nice tools here um, and frameworks as well. Next. And in my own work, you know, my community partners um, really keep me honest and on target in terms of contextualizing and understanding community voice um, as we are thinking about implementation. So they always remind me how disempowering it is when we walk in as experts um, in the research world or in our implementation research um, worlds um, and say, you know, here's the new evidence, here are the guidelines, here's the latest, you know, go and do this. How disempowering it is when they haven't been involved in that evidence generation, when they don't actually feel like um, they are reflected in uh, the evidence that is being generated, right? And that it doesn't reflect their values, their lived reality. So this is always important that we contextualize the mistrust, right? Um, the mistrust is warranted um, and uh, we have to change the institutions if we are going to gain the trust of our community partners. Okay, next. And here's a reference for that. Um, we also have to think about, you know, I love the how Producta laid out for us how structural racism is really um, a system level issue, right? Um, it is not just within operating within one system, it is interconnected and it's working across systems. So I think as we're thinking about our implementation, we have to be bringing a systems science perspective to this and thinking about what are the key levers where we can really have impact in terms of addressing inequities um, and racism. I think a really underutilized area has been policy and policy implementation. And I think there's some great work by Karen Emmons and David Chambers on what it would mean to have a focus on policy implementation uh, with a focus on addressing social determinants of health. So I think these are some under um, studied and underutilized areas for us to think about. Okay, next. Okay, so as I wrap up, um, I just want to recognize, you know, health inequities are not new. They have been long-standing. Racial inequities and injustices have been uh, long-standing. But I do think that this is an important time for us to reflect on not only naming structural racism, which we have begun to do um, more globally, but taking action to address it. We must be accountable um, about that. And I think we can kind of think about chipping away at health inequities, but if we want to make fundamental shifts in addressing it, I think we have to really bring this justice perspective this anti-racism lens and again be accountable in how we are actively dismantling structural racism. Next. A couple ending reflections. So I think we've talked about this a lot in terms of our implementation uh, research and practice, but I think this is not something where we can kind of check it off. Anna Bowman always uh, reminds you of this. It's not a checklist where we can kind of say, okay, we've thought about that, but we have to be really um, 
really accountable and reflective um, on an ongoing basis about how this might be operating um, in our work. We have to, again, really name and call out uh, structural racism and social determinants of health and really think about ways, even if it's, um, you know, small ways that we're bringing it into our work, that we are being mindful about that. I think we also have to reflect on the fact that there is a very long history of work outside of our field on structural racism, on community engagement, and on health equity. And I think we need to elevate this work. Most of it has been done by um, scholars, uh, Black, Indigenous, and uh, Latin, Latino scholars. And I think we need to elevate this work and think about implementation science, how we can contextualize and learn from it um, with a focus on justice and equity. We also have to make sure we're not reinforcing um, inequities through our own work and implementation, whether it's through the selection of settings that are more resourced or the exclusion of populations that are experiencing uh, structural racism and violence. So it's critical these decisions have implications in terms of how um, inequities might be re reinforced and um, um, exacerbated. Okay, next. I'll just end by saying, you know, as we wrote this paper a couple of years ago um, in 2018, we had uh, we were invited to do a commentary, and we had much, much more to say on this. Um, and we uh, got together um, along with Natalie Moist and Derek Griffiths, and Derek has been writing about issues of uh, anti-racism and structural racism um, for very long. And so we we learned so much from him in terms of um, really thinking about what it would mean to reframe uh, implementation science with the focus on racial equity um, and justice and really thinking that through and thinking about that again not only in our research not only in reflection um, as researchers at our institutions but thinking about the multi-layered um, approach that is needed to consider that um, as we're thinking about the power dynamics with our community partners as we're thinking about who is and isn't reflected at our institutions when we're thinking about what is and isn't uh, supported by funding institutions so this is a multi-layered effort right and i think the implementation piece is one important part um, but it will take addressing all of these various components i think to make an impact So I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Projecta and April uh, for their collaboration here. I want to thank my community partners from the National Witness Project um, who have inspired a lot of this work. Um, I want to thank CARDIS, the Collaborative for Anti-Racism Dissemination and Implementation Science, for their support. And I've also put here, um, we have a link here for our Implementation Science Initiative, where we have put together many of the readings and resources that we see are critical to implementation science, anti-racism, and addressing structural racism. So thank you. And I'm excited to learn from you all today um, in the Q&A and the small group work. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shelton and Dr. Adsul. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I have the privilege of being able to um, uh, facilitate the Q&A for this um, exciting presentation. Um, and it's just such an honor because I think so highly of my friends and collaborators here. And we've gotten a lot of really great questions from all of you in the audience. So thank you for putting those into the chat and please continue to do so. Uh, before we begin, I just wanna note, I have been uh, doing a little bit of work here on the side um, where I've been putting in um, some citations that uh, Prajakta and Rachel were sharing in their presentation. I apologize that some of them were hard to access. I um, will be putting these references together into a less list and sharing them with the conference organizers. So no worries about being able to download the chat or being able to access the paper. I will be sending those over uh, to our organizers so you'll be getting those soon. Um, in the meantime, we have about 10 minutes or so uh, to do some Q&A and discussion. Um, so please, again, feel free to add those into the chat um, and then we will hopefully be able to get to all of these questions. Um, to begin with, um, I have one question here I'd like to start with. Um, we have a question from the audience um, asking the panelists, um, particularly Dr. Shelton, um, in your work, you've incorporated anti-racism into your work over time. Do you mind sharing a little bit about your journey? 
Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. So um, in terms of my background, my training was in uh, CBPR and community-based participatory research um, as a master's student, and then social epidemiology. So um, Nancy Krieger and her work um, were very instrumental in my doctoral studies, and I focused my dissertation on the impact that racial discrimination and mistrust had on um, contextualizing cancer screening behaviors among African-American women. Um, and so as I started doing my postdoc, um, I started feeling like the work that I was doing was very descriptive and quantitative, but I wasn't actually making an impact um, in terms of changing anything in the community. And so I started thinking about, you know, are there existing evidence-based programs that are already out there developed by and for the community that are addressing inequities that could be more widely implemented um, and sustained? And so I partnered with this group of African-American cancer survivors who were already in evidence-based program. They were doing amazing work. And, um, you know, I said, let's partner together and think about this. And I had all these ideas and they said, hold up, hold up. Um, you know, the most pressing uh, issue for us is we've, you know, lost half of our programs in the last couple of years with the economic downturn. And we want to focus on how to sustain our program that we already know works and that has an impact. So I completely shifted my research program to implementation science. You know, this is around 20, 2009, 2010. So, it was just starting to get off. So the timing, they really brought me to implementation science because I felt like I needed to answer that question and understand that. Um, so that that has been a fundamental part. And that program was initially developed because they were trying to address issues of structural racism that they were experiencing in their community. Um, and a lot of our lessons learned about, um, about how to sustain relates to issues of, of um, structural racism in terms of the extent to which community programs and disparities programs are embraced or not within our academic institutions and what that looks like. So it's been a constant um, stream uh, of my work. And I really had some aha moments in the last couple of years where I, I thought, why aren't we making this more explicit? You know, this is we're not naming structural racism when this is what we're talking about. So um, I think for me, um, getting together with April and Projecta and thinking that through, um, I think it was there, but it just wasn't on the surface in terms of how we've all been talking about it in implementation science. So that's what brought me to this work. And Prajakta, with Rachel kicking that off, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about your journey too and what brought you to, to this work. Thanks, April. Um, so I think I come from a very different uh, perspective when I think about uh, equity and racism uh, with much of my work in the global health space, where uh, as a primary care physician, having worked in resource limited settings, understanding, you know, the staff turnover, the resource limited nature of public health practice is just daunting. Um, and when I transferred over to the public health side of things, it was so easy for us to say, oh, blame the providers and blame the physicians, right? So blame the practitioners. They are not doing it right. We are doing the research right, you know? So it's how do we actually engage communities to make sure that the benefit uh, reaches the populations, but also engage the stakeholders that are delivering the intervention for us and uh, reflect both of these principles while we are designing, developing, and implementing interventions. So for me, that has been sort of the forefront. However, just like Rachel mentioned uh, a little bit, it has always been sort of in the in the you know, trenches of when we are doing the work, reflecting on our practices, reflecting on our processes, understanding that as an institution representative in the community, um, I, in fact, in the last few weeks, I have gotten uh, community partners telling me about how I reflect as an investigator and institution that may not be as welcomed in the community. You know? So how do you acknowledge that? How do you accept that and you say, you know, I can't change the past, but I can improve what I am doing in the community today. And I want to like make sure that the benefit reaches all of the uh, community and not just pockets in the community, right? So that's, you know, that has been sort of a constant reflection for my own practice, my own research. Um, and, you know, it's hard work and, you know, you need peer support like April and Rachel <laughs> some days to like make sure that, you know, we keep uh, reflecting and keep making progress. 
Great, thank you both. We're getting um, a lot of questions here in the chat and I believe that we only have about two more minutes left, but I wanna summarize a theme that I think I'm seeing here. And that's a question, um, well, first of all, uh, a lot of excitement about the presentation, uh, presentation and ideas shared, but it sounds like our audience is bought in. They're ready to take this on or they're already wearing an anti-racist lens or perspective. Does it have to be a lens or is this something that's a culture shift that we need to have in research and in practice? And it sounds like we still have some questions about um, how to take these approaches and apply them within institutional contexts that may not be quite ready to take an anti-racist approach or where it might be still challenging to talk about racism or structural racism. We don't have time to get into all of those different pieces, but if there's one or two um, uh, comments that either of you would like to make related to that, I think what I heard from both of you, even in your comments about your past, um, your path to this place, it sounds like a lot of it is conversation um, and also um, developing some trusted relation, developing trusted relationships, but it truly does involve a broader community and that you aren't alone in doing the work. Find some other allies, use the, communicate what the words mean, what they mean to you, what they mean to the science um, and what they mean for others. Um, Rachel and Shelton, uh, Rachel, Rachel Shelton, uh, Rachel and Projecta, any, any last words on that before we um, go to the next session? That's so important. Um, and I think that new piece on implementing any racism interventions gets into that a little bit. I think the leadership piece is critical. And I think, you know, you can think about building your allies, but I think institutions have to be elevating the voices of people who are putting this as a priority, right? Because that really sets the vision. And again, I do think, you know, people think, oh, training's not enough, but I do think training is a foundational piece. It sets the stage. And if those key decision makers don't understand what we're talking about, if they are not thinking about and reflecting or being exposed to this, I think that's a real problem because then they kind of see that's for these other people to do, like this is not on me. So I think training should be required and should be foundational as a starting place for some of these fun fundamental changes. Um, and I think we have been creative in terms about thinking about resources and um, opportunities. There's much more funding now and visibility. Institutions want to do better and be seen as doing better. And um, people are being forced to be more accountable about that. So sometimes I think that that can be another kind of lever that we can use. But some of this will take, I mean, much of this will take time. This is not gonna be happening overnight. And I think we should share from each other as a community of practice about what's working well at our institutions too and in implementing this. Projecta. Um, just two points quickly. One, you don't have to be the expert in everything. You know, we can, we, we can listen, find partners that can uh, provide that voice, even in our own research, even in, in our own institutions. So um, going without agendas to a lot of these partnerships and presenting yourself as ready to listen and ready to understand, uh, important over there. And then the second point is um, wherever possible, even within our own institutions, how could we elevate others' voices, not just uh, ours? So always consciously reflecting on um, lifting. Uh, I love Renard's uh, quote over here, lifting as we rise. So if we are rising, how do we bring a few others with us? So um, very uh, with that, <laughs> that's all I had to say. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Thank you both for um, your presentations, sharing your reflections and sharing your resources. Um, I also wanna say thank you to the hosts for inviting us for this um, keynote panel. Um, you're, start, you're creating a community of activists um, implementation science activists. And I encourage all of us to lean on each other and support each other in this important work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shelton, Dr. O, Dr. Azul. That was um, absolutely amazing. And uh, I think we're all just so humbled, honored, inspired, and activated. So um, we are going to move to our breakout sessions. So just wanted to mention um, a little bit about that. Um, we'll have 30 minutes to move into the breakouts. Again, these breakout sessions will give you an opportunity to hear from the authors of the articles included 
in the supplement, um, bringing equity to implementation. And um, you'll also have an opportunity for some Q&A uh, with authors. Um, so we ask that you kind of pick, pick one that you'd like to go to, um, although you do have an opportunity also to, to move around. So we, as we think about those six um, elements that are really essential to equitable implementation, we have papers that represent these elements, uh, trusting relationships, with a wonderful paper, Trust the People, it's incredible. Dismantling power structures, we have a paper on youth leadership and action, investments and decision-making uh, to advance equity. We know implementation consists of lots of decisions. Um, and so it's an incredible um, article around community-driven decision-making, community takes the wheel, critical perspectives and how that is really long overdue in implementation science, um, really looking forward to that. Uh, we have a couple on community-defined evidence, which Rachel really lifted up in some of her comments. So we have two papers there, listening to Black parents, and community-defined evidence as a framework for equitable implementation. We also have a couple papers related to adaptation and cultural adaptation, contextual adaptation, issues that were also raised in the plenary, uh, faith-based organizations, um, uh, as leaders of implementation and community-driven health solutions on Chicago South Side. So you'll have a chance to, to meet with those authors. Um, I do want to encourage folks um, after that to please join us for the closing plenary. Those last 30 minutes, we have an incredible uh, closing plenary with Dr. Ioma Aruka and really looking forward um, to, to rejoining with you at that point. Um, you go back to the event page uh, to be able to click on the green button of the, of the session that you would like to join. Or again, you can go back to, it's in the, the chat right now, implementequity.kcevents.org. That's your home base. Anytime you go to that link, which is the event page, you can shuffle back and forth between any session. So please go there now and choose the session that you would like to join um, until 1230. And we look forward to seeing you for the closing plenary. Thank you so much.